Good evening. I'm Angelica Morrison, reporter with WBFO News, and welcome to Housing in Black and White. It's a discussion for our racial equity project. Tonight's topic, housing inequities. Here to help us unpack this multifaceted issue, we have Professor Henry Taylor Jr. from UB's Department of Urban Planning. We also have Sarah Wooten from the Partnership for the Public Good. And from UB Pediatrics, we have Dr. Melinda Cameron and John Washington from Push Buffalo. Now, before we get started, just want to let you guys know out there on Facebook that if you'd like to participate, please feel free to leave your questions in the comment section on Facebook. You can also send them via email, fblive at wbfo.org. Let's get started. Professor Taylor, now, in some of our previous conversations, uh, you've mentioned that um, racial segregation is not a part of Buffalo's DNA. Now, I kind of found that a little shocking since it kind of goes against the Buffalo that I've known since I was a kid, you know. Um, so can you briefly explain what you mean when you say racial segregation is not a part of Buffalo's DNA? Sure. Uh, Buffalo is what I call a, a third tier African-American community. And, and by a third tier African-American community, I mean that large numbers of blacks did not start coming to Buffalo until after 1940. Mm. As early as 1940, the African-American population was only about 17,000 people living in this city. So between 1940 and something like 1980, or 70, uh, more than 80 to 85,000 African-Americans moved into the location. In these earlier years, uh, most blacks lived in the low east side and they shared residential space with uh, uh, immigrants and particularly Russian Jews. So in the neighborhoods where they were most heavily concentrated, that was uh, literally a Jewish community, but they shared space with Irish right. and, and others. Mm -hmm. Then in the 1930s, uh, the city began to imagine what I call the one big city right. way of thinking about Buffalo. When they saw the city and the suburbs as one large <coughs> city, and in that moment of time, they begin to make loans available to whites to be able to move out into the suburban areas. Now, is that the redlining? I call it white lining. Okay. White lining in the sense that those loans that were made available were made available in those areas of the region where whites were concentrated. Such loans were not made in those localities where African Americans were concentrated. One of the reasons is that those were places where housing values were not considered viable because of the large numbers of other mixed uses, apartments, et cetera, et cetera. But as late as 1950, we have evidence showing blacks and whites still remaining uh, living in shared residential spaces. There was another move in the 1970s. And in the 1970s, the government now made available loans for rehab and other low interest rate lo loans targeted for central city communities. At that time, you begin to see an exodus of those whites remaining on the west side, moving, uh, w remaining on the east side, moving into the west side of, of, of cities. Okay. So in 1970 onward, we see an intensification of residential, uh, of the isolation of blacks on the east side with whites moving both to the west side and to the outer suburban areas. So they were moving toward opportunity. They were moving toward monetary opportunities mm -hmm. in the sense that uh, new forms of home ownerships were being made available in those white oriented spaces. Mm -hmm. So the pattern that we see across Buffalo's history, wherever whites are concentrated, investments follow mm -hmm. at the public level and at the private level. Okay. White spots, investments, black spots, no investments. And, and this is why I always say the issue confronting blacks is not an issue of residential segregation. It is an issue of the failure of the public and the private sector 
to develop those communities in which they are concentrated. Right. So it is a form of oppression and exploitation. Right. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Um, moving on to affordability and displacement. The city of Buffalo is known for its inexpensive housing. It's one of the things that makes this place a great place to live. Still, statistics show that more than half of the families in Buffalo can't make rent. Sarah, a couple of questions. First, why is this a problem for some and not others? And what happens when people can't afford their rent? Yeah, so like you said, affordability is a big problem for a lot of people. Um, more than half of folks in Buffalo pay more than 30% of their income on mm -hmm. housing costs. Um, and a lot of folks actually face a, what's called a severe housing burden, which means that they're paying more than 50% of their income on severe. housing costs. Yeah. And so 15% um, of white households face that severe housing cost. Uh, more like 30% of black households face that severe housing cost. And something like 37% of Hispanic households face that housing cost. Um, so the burden of kind of unaffordability in the city of Buffalo is not spread evenly, like you said, across all residents here. Um, and, you know, when folks can't afford their rent, there are a lot of issues that come up. Um, they're forced to, you know, they can't pay for certain other necessities like right. um, food or medical care, utilities. Um, and in some cases, folks become homeless. Um, That's where the displacement comes in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So in terms of uh, causes there, um, you know, as you probably know, the city of Buffalo is, is one of the poorest cities in the nation. Um, and a lot of that has to do with uh, low wages. So a third of the of the city's jobs are in the service sector, and those have pretty low wages. So around um, less than actually the the median is twenty six thousand dollars in terms of annual income. Wow. Um, and Black and Hispanic folks are most likely to um, have those jobs as well. But in terms of um, displacement, I think from from the the data that I've looked at. Um, it's really difficult to kind of see in terms of numbers how this is happening in Buffalo. Um, a lot of the, the evidence of displacement that we've seen comes from kind of anecdotal um, conversations with folks and um, because the, the data, you know, the, the most reliable data is the census um, and the and American Community Survey from the right. Census Bureau um, and that's two years behind. So the most recent data we have there is from 2016. Um, and that can tell us a few things, right? So in the Fruit Belt neighborhood, for example. I was example. just going to say, <laughs> isn't that like an example of... of yeah, products? yeah. So there it's especially marked. Um, so you can see uh, with the census data there that rent has uh, increased by about 40% mm -hmm. um, since I think it's 2006. That sounds um, scary. It's like if you live there, you're afraid if that happens, where are you going to go? Right, exactly. And you it's know? not even just a pr problem for renters, which is yeah. what I think kind of we talk about a lot. Um, but also for, for homeowners because as um, property increases in these specific neighborhoods, uh, Fruit Belt, Allentown, um, Parkside, places like that, um, the city hasn't done a reassessment in the last eight years. This is the first time they've done a citywide reassessment since then. So property values in those areas are likely to go way up um, and so might property taxes. And so even if you're a homeowner um, in those areas, like in the Fruit Belt, if you're on a fixed income, which a lot of folks there are because they're senior citizens, right. um, or if you are making the low wages that we were just talking about, mm -hmm. your housing isn't secured. Even if you're not renting, it seems like it should be secured. It's not. Right. Right. Well, thank you, sir. There's, a, yeah. there's a point I want to make on that. We, we often, two points I want to make. One is that we, we often talk about this issue of affordability. Right. But to me, we have to place with affordability the quality of the units themselves. Mm -hmm. On Buffalo's east side, you have both a serious issue of affordability, right. where some in 2016, some 38% of the households there are paying 50% or more of their income on housing. But the quality of those units mm -hmm. are extraordinarily poor. When we add the quality of those units to the larger issue, Every single discussion that I've heard in this region over the past 10 years about housing affordability has dealt with new housing to be constructed. Mm -hmm. Not a single one has dealt with the big issue of how do we improve significantly 
the actually existing housing units in which people live. And so I think that the conversation to affordability have to be shifted to the issue of affordability and improving the quality of, of housing units for those actually existing rental units in which people are living. Right. And when we move away from that, policy makers, foundations and others are skirting the real issue mm -hmm. to talk about something smaller, more pro uh, uh, less problematic, but that won't mean anything to the vast majority of people living in the city of Buffalo. Good, good point. Folks who are already living in their houses every day. Definitely, definitely. All right, well, just want to remind you folks out there on Facebook, anyone who's showing up late, we are talking about housing inequities. It's for our racial equity project. If you'd like to participate, please leave your questions in the comments section on our Facebook page. And let's see if we have any questions so far. No, not yet. Continuing on to health consequences. As many of us know, Buffalo has some very old housing stock more than two-thirds of the house was built before 1939 and that means a lot of folks are exposed to some really dangerous elements dr cameron what are some of the health implications related to living in houses that are this old okay i can mostly speak as a pediatrician absolutely um and i've been doing urban pediatrics in buffalo for over 35 years on the east side on the west side and i've been treating mostly children of color um i I'm treating kids for lead poisoning, and the, basically the housing they're coming from is from tenant housing. Okay. And it, you know, it, it has, it's not the city housing, it's, not, it's always been tenant housing that they're in. Um, and that housing, that older housing stock has just created so many problems um, in terms of maintenance, in terms of when these kids are treated, they, it's very difficult um, to find a safe place for them to go back to. Uh, sometimes they've been evicted, even though it's illegal, mm. um, by landlords because of that. Um, and asthma is also another huge problem. Uh, a lot of our, our kids, especially on the west side of the city, uh, suffer from asthma. A lot of that can be from moisture issues right. in terms of mold in the older housing. Um, also cockroaches, yeah. which are drawn to water. Yeah. So just the older housing stock itself that is not kept in good repair creates a lot of moisture issues, mm -hmm. allergen issues, mm -hmm. toxic issues mm -hmm. um, for the kids that are living in them. So things like cockroaches and other sort of insects environment, that also contributes to exacerbation of asthma? Oh yes, okay. yes. Okay. And, and it's really, I think it's under-recognized. I yeah, mean, absolutely. when kids go to the doc, they don't really, we don't know the housing that they're living in. We can't see all the things that could be really causing their problems. <coughs> so you're treating asthma with medications, but if they're going back to these same houses and if they have environmental triggers, environmental triggers aren't the only reason for asthma, right. but it is a large part of that. Right. Um, so it's, it's, it's frustrating to treat the kids when the base, their basic health issues really are from that housing. Right, and it's heartbreaking because this is the most vulnerable in our community. You know, Definitely. The, the Obviously, yes. Kids can't can't they can't talk for themselves. They can't speak for themselves. And there's it's 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 difficult. A lot of adults don't speak for them. Yeah. Definitely. Okay, thank you, Dr. Cameron. Moving on to utilities. Now, you wouldn't think that the light bill or the heat bill would be a factor when discussing housing inequities, but it is. Uh, for families living below the poverty level here in Erie County, energy costs take up about 75% of the household income, and many of those families are minorities. Mr. Washington, what are some of the factors that are making it hard for these families to compete? Well, it's, it's the housing stock. You know, we've talked about it um, in many different ways, and you know, you know, before you had people who were paying more for their heating bills than for their rent. Now that rents are rising, right. um, that is not a, the same problem, but it's it is the same problem. And so, you know, our vision is really to address what what Henry's talking about. Um, the city of Buffalo has spent over seven billion dollars. Not the city, the city, county, um, and state government have over invested over seven billion dollars to leverage twenty billion dollars of real estate investment in Buffalo in the past. That's eight a good years. thing, right? 
So what that has done is it has risen property values, has risen rent, it has attracted um, and inspired a level of speculation that Buffalo has not seen before. And basically, it's a form of colonialism in my mind, in that people see the opportunity, the low property values in Buffalo in relationship to other markets, and they are looking to profit and extract as much as, as they can from it. And I think that with those kind of resources, um, our local government officials could have invested in doing exactly what Henry is talking about, and that is to um, weatherize, um, remediate the lead, and do a, a whole house approach because all these things work better when they're done together. So we could have fixed an enormous amount of how homes on the east side uh, to make them rentable, to provide people uh, who are in danger of losing their homes because of these utility crunches for folks who maybe finished paying off their house 20 years ago, um, but they're unable to afford utilities, property taxes, and all of these rising costs. So in all of the housing conversation, utilities are baked into what is considered housing costs even by HUD standards. And I think why we focus on them is that we are at a point technologically where we can heat homes uh, and we can give electricity to homes um, at no cost to the individual. And we can build an entirely new infrastructure um, to how we think about public utilities that married with repairing these homes um, could lift so much of the burden off of people in poverty, mm -hmm. could create so many jobs, could take advantage of this new green economy um, that we hear about, that we see um, that our governor invested $1.2 billion in Elon Musk, a man who shoots $90 million rockets into space, um, that if we really were serious about that, that we would relate the solar panels and the jobs that come to those to the individual homes. Now, there have been some crumbs sprinkled around Buffalo, but when you look at the amount of public resources, um, some of which that we're still trying to figure out how to count and how to account for that have been invested in the new development, uh, we need to take a look at how we are investing resources in the existing housing stock, making sure that people can stay in their homes, stay in their neighborhoods, um, and to be healthy. And there are so many costs that are not considered mm -hmm. to the cost of the lead crisis. What does that cost our schools? What does that cost the people, the families that are dealing with uh, people with developmental disabilities? So when we look at the total cost of, of, of poverty to people, the monetary cost to the county, and we look at how we're using our resources, we are investing in making Buffalo richer, making Buffalo whiter, and making Buffalo an easier city to deal with as opposed to fixing the legacy um, that we stepped in. And so, you know, utilities may seem like a separate issue, right. um, but right now the utility companies are also doubling down on their infrastructure. They're building new pipelines. They're figuring out how to use solar to make a distributed grid that still benefits them and not the people. And we have the technology to use microgrids. We have the technology. Um, there's a geothermal um, building just built on Grant Street. You know, we have a net zero house. So we have the technology to eliminate you know, fossil fuels and the extractive processes that come from generating energy and actually reinvest those resources and giving people jobs and lifting people from, from those bills and then making those homes healthy and safe. Right. And instead of following that clear path of what is best for the kids that most of these politicians and even people in the private market always talk about, mm -hmm. we have doubled down on trickle-down economics, and right now it is, you know, we are getting trickled on um, left and right. Trickled and on, trickled left on. and right, that's let, something. Let me add a, <laughs> you know, a layer okay. to that. Yes, please. Uh, because when we, we talk <coughs> about how do we fix the actually existing rental units, and I'm going to always go back to the actually existing rental units. Because there are two things that we know. None, we're not going to build enough new housing to put everybody in. Right. And we also know we're not going to move everybody out of the east side over to the west side. And if we did, most of the people with money on the west side would then move to some other location. Mm. That's, that's real. The city will say, we don't have enough money to do that. And, and I would agree with that. But what we can do we can put together hardcore laws that we enforce. If someone does not fix their property, take it away from them. We have an existing receivership program. Why not take those properties away from individuals? Then take the rents that people are paying mm -hmm. and funnel them back into the, to the, to the units themselves. Mm -hmm. Supplement the existing receivership programs with other resources and other dollars so that weatherization is mandatory. It's not an option. Right. 
Driving a car without a, a muffler is not an option. Mm -hmm. You have to do it. So why not do that with weatherization? Having lead in a house, it's not acceptable. Right. If you have lead in your house and you try to rent it, you should go to jail, prison. If I drive a car drunk, even if I don't hit anybody, mm -hmm. I go to jail. So if you're renting those properties, you should go to jail. But again, if we take the property through the existing receivership programs, mm -hmm. then use the existing rents to invest in those. And then what if we ask all of the corporations in the region to put together 5% of their profits for the establishment of an east side development fund each year, just mm -hmm. 5%. Yeah. Then we have the additional resources to pump into this. What I'm saying is Stokely Carmichael, then Kwame Touré, and Charles V. Hamilton said years ago, they laid out the three principles of making things happen. Number one, if you want the right answer, then you must ask the right question. Exactly. If you want to solve a problem, you must formulate it correctly. And third, your premises must be based on truth and reality, not fantasy and myths. The fundamental problem that is facing us in the city right now is we will not attack the issue of the existing uh, housing units. Right. By lowering the rents to make them affordable, and by raising the quality of those rents. That's the challenge that we face, right. and there is a solution to it. And the question is, do we, ha we, do we care enough? Right. Do we care enough right. to pursue that path? Yeah, yeah that's, that's definitely it. People actually um, caring enough and about the structures where folks live in. Let's see if we have any questions here on Facebook, and nope. Doesn't look like we have anything. Just a reminder, if anyone wants to participate, feel free to leave your questions on the comment center section on Facebook. You could also send emails to fblive at wbfo.org. Okay, just what you were talking about. Solutions starting to heal the wounds of uh, housing inequities here in Buffalo. Professor Taylor, let's take it back to you. Um, I know we previously mentioned on the phone that you said changing the way the city makes investments. Um, how do you think that'll help fix this? It just seems like well, such well, a problem well, well, that has so many different branches, you know? It does have many branches. And, and for that reason, I think that you have multiple yeah. solutions based on a particular part of, of the city. I don't think you have one blanket solution all over the place. On the west side of, of Buffalo, for example, I think we're really facing a problem of, 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 of displacement. And, and, the, and the problem of displacement uh, th that we're looking at in that danger c comes from two places. Yeah. On the one hand, rents and prices are, are rising. On the other hand, we are catering in that part of the city to empty nesters, millennials, uh, and members of the knowledge class, professionals, etc. That group have a set, set of wants, needs, and interests that are different from many of the actually existing lower income populations. So, and that also is changing the housing stock. So you're seeing increasing number of two bedrooms, et cetera, that are occurring. You're seeing shifts and changes in the types of shops and stores. Bottom line is the community is becoming unfriendly and unaffordable to many of the lower income families and groups. And so they're being pushed out both on the places of, of on the on the on the places that can't afford it, but also on the fact that it is unfriendly to them. So in that area, you need to fight for inclusive zoning, but also the utilization of community land trust in order to slow that process down and to create levels of affordability. A second danger zone would be that strip of east side neighborhoods adjacent to Main Street. If you watch and see what is going on, those communities that are closest to uh, Main Street 
those communities that are anchored around our anchor institutions mm -hmm. like the universities and the hospitals are danger zones for displacement. Those areas need to be overlaid again with land, trust, okay. uh, and other aggressive policies. On the far east side, you need a different okay. strategy, mm -hmm. a strategy that enables people to take control over the developmental process, starting with the utilization of com a radical community land trusts that are designed to give them control over the land and in turn control over the development. I'll stop for there, but the idea is that you've got to have multiple strategies based upon the parts of town. And finally, you've got to create a situation where these different corporations in the city are asked to create a general fund mm. under the control of residents that will enable us to do the gap financing in these different neighborhoods and communities. That way, the burden is not on the city to use its nickels and dimes exclusively for the development of one part of town. Mm. Well, Thank I just want to add to that. that okay, and then um, we'll take some questions from the Facebook. They finally showed up. We had some technical difficulties. Well, Go the, ahead. A lot of those nickels and dimes, the city is not collecting. Oh. Um, and the city is not. So we have a 485A tax system um, that, uh, that exempts for 12 years developers from paying taxes. We have Erie County Industrial Development Agency, Empire State Development, um, and right now, the budget reflects a fee structure. We're going to tax residents, and we're not going to tax the largest developers. So mm -hmm. one, before we even get to asking corporations to pitch in, we should ask them to do what they need to do, which is pay their taxes. They need to do right. both. Right. They got to pitch in right now. Right. I, right. You, they got to do both. They right. got to pay their fair taxes. Right. But they've got to invest in this larger right. fund. Right. right. And then I think... Gentrification is a domino effect. So mm. what I see is that as the west side gentrifies, those folks are moving to Niagara Falls, they're moving to the east side, and so to me, like the f part of one of the initial waves of gentrification is when you have displacement on the west side, you have people moving to the east side, and that's the first wave. Also, how we resettle. So the immigrant population is used as a cushion or a buffer between generationally poor people of color in the United States and uh, a nice way to move a different, more docile population in that, and there's this narrative uh, while we ignore the, the real suffering of many of the immigrant communities that, that we work with at the Grand Street Neighborhood Center, oh, you know, that right. they come in and they build the economy and they build businesses while, while we're not looking at, at folks who are, you know, raising eight, nine children in, in, in a space um, because they, they because of the poverty issues. And so even in the resettlement process, um, when people are given these six months worth of resources and then left to this housing industry, so uh, many of them are, are then living in these slumlord homes mm -hmm. um, and dealing with that because they do not understand how to fight back and, and frankly right. a lot of them are comfortable with where they're at so we have this domino effect where that every neighbor even the gentrification of elmwood is then having people move to uh grant street and niagara street which is having people move you know further to the east side so i also think that we need to look at this as a whole picture and for all neighborhoods to see that they have a self-interest in maintaining the stability of each other neighborhood because if they don't then folks are going to be moving and it may not be the right. typical millennial gentrifiers it may be people that look like them but they're moving into their neighborhood which is putting the infill in and then once all of the the, the those folks have moved off of the west side, that's going to be a steady flow. And so we want to create stability where gentrification naturally is going to consistently push people. And there is a class of people around the country that Buffalo really has not seen a lot of that, that are going, okay. I mean, if you look at the prices, the luxury housing, the plans that they have, and so much of this is dri driven by real estate investment and the fact that Wall Street and folks on Wall Street know that their money isn't real. And the easiest thing to do is to build a building to create a form of safe investment, especially in a market that has property values as low as Buffalo. So I think Dr. Taylor is exactly right that those are the focus areas, but we also need to help everyone understand from a holistic view that what happens over here is going to affect what happens over here. And I think that's difficult for people to see because of the strategic divestment that people have seen for so long. It's hard for them to believe that someone wants their land mm -hmm. until you show them on the real property thing 
who actually owns it, even in the places where they haven't seen it built up yet. So we really need to do some education around helping people understand how this process works um, so that they really do understand the meaning of these land trusts, the meaning of control of land in relation to how we make the values of each neighborhood really manifest and facilitate what we what, what neighborhoods want to see for themselves. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, we've been having some trouble here with our technology, but I was able to get some uh, questions here off of Facebook. Do, 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 do. Here's a question. Uh, what suggestions do you have for how to require landlords to mitigate some of the factors that contribute to asthma or other health issues? For example, exterminating roaches, dehumidifying moist areas. It's difficult. Mm -hmm. I mean, as a pediatrician, I'm mostly dealing with the families. I'm really not dealing with the other public health aspect of it. The Erie County Health Department actually deals with the landlords. Part of the, our issue in Buffalo sometimes is some of the housing issues, the health issues, are dealt with by the health department, by the county health department, and then we have the city who really is in charge of the housing courts. And there's, all, there's been some issues involving that in terms of trying to mesh that. There is a lead action plan that has recently come out. It is still in the planning stages. And I think a lot of it d does have to do with actually enforcing existing regulation. Mm -hmm. There are regulations out there, but they aren't enforced. Okay. The, the housing court needs to be completely yeah. redone. Um, I've seen people where we take the landlord to housing court, and then the health department says the place is unlivable, but they don't take the building, and three months later, another person is coming into our office and saying, I need help in the exact same apartment. Yeah. What, what I think huh. w w we need to do and what I would put forward as a, as a strategy. We need to develop a demonstration project. Mm -hmm. And in this demonstration project, we need to create a situation where we can say work with a local high school, train volunteer building code inspectors. Mm -hmm. We flood the neighborhood. We inspect every house. Those houses that do not meet a rigorous standard, the landlord is given a specific time frame to repair and to bring it up to a certain standard. If that doesn't happen, you take the house, you bring it into a receivership program, you stop the rents, take the rents, and begin to invest in that house till you, you bring it up to, to code. What I'm saying is that under the current systems of attempting to piecemeal this stuff, mm -hmm. nothing will ever change. Mm -hmm. There's no mm -hmm. way you can force landlords to do anything right. when the city has taken the position that the landlords are like a god, that right. you cannot touch them, mm -hmm. and which the housing court has relinquished its right to be considered a court. Right. So we have to create a policy that moves that way. In my position, if the current policy makers do not do it, let's put together radical politics and, and, and vote them out and bring in people in office who will. I mean, the time has come. We can either become serious about building a just city mm -hmm. or be happy with the injustice that we see all around us. Okay. Take their houses and fix them. I love, I love that idea. And Definitely. to your point about uh, you know policymakers not uh, moving on these issues, and to John's point um, about you know the situation of housing court and people being evicted even when their homes are falling apart, right? And the ten and the landlords aren't fixing anything. Um, in other cities, it's it's illegal to um, to evict tenants when. Uh, the house is below code. And right. in some other cities as well, um, like Rochester, uh, landlords are actually, the houses are, are inspected for lead even when there are fewer units. So in mm -hmm. Buffalo, um, I think it's three or more units you do have to inspect for lead, mm -hmm. um, but under three units you don't. Okay. In Rochester, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. You still have it lead inspected right away. Lead right away. That makes a lot of sense. And, 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 and again, I, I want to go back to, to this issue of lead because yeah. it, 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 it's very serious. Serious. It, Very it serious. destroys lives. Literally. From and the and how can and you... it's unseen. It's how, unseen. 
How can pe- nobody go to jail? It's it's criminal. Yeah. And and I'm saying that if there is a law that says if you drunk drive, you go to jail. There has to be a law to say if you rent a house full of lead, knowing the dangers right. that it is, you go to jail. Yeah, it's, it's not complicated. What is complicated is a government, starting with the mayor, that refuses, for whatever the reason, to do the thing that we need to do. We must, if we want to create equity, like I'm not a kumbaya guy. I don't care if you love or hate me. It don't matter to me. What does matter to me is that every human being has a right to live in quality housing that is affordable. That is a human right. Yeah, especially the children. It is a human right. And we need to stop these human rights violations in Buffalo. It's not complicated. Yeah, definitely, definitely. What were we saying earlier, the windows are the worst in some of the houses, right? Well, that's the thing. Rehabbing the house can solve many health issues. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not just lead rehab, but as in terms of weatherization and like utility bills and moisture issues, all of those things are housing issues. And so it's, it's more of a larger concept of improving the house that that is the remedy to the health issues. Mm-hmm. Good point. Let's check out our Facebook. It looks like this one's working now. It wasn't working. In. We have Lynn from Cheektawaga. Let's see. Oh, she's got a good question. She says, if you suspect you have lead in your home and you rent, what steps as a renter should you take? Um, should, should you demand action from your landlord? And what's the path for improving this? What do you guys think? <laughs> I mean, that's a dangerous path. I mean, yeah, like, what theoretically, you, you should be able to go to housing court. Uh, you should be able to get your home inspected. Okay. The reality is a lot of landlords, when you make noise about lead, they evict you. And they'll bring somebody else in who will Well, my recommendation is to contact the, the public health exactly. bureau. Exactly. Uh, contact I don't the worry public about, health bureau. Yeah, Lynn from contact Chitawaga. the public health. And uh, wherever, whenever public health knows that there's a problem centering around air, lead, they will send they will out see. inspectors to take a look at, 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 at that uh, situation. And, uh, and that person should move in, in, in that direction. I think that when the health of your children is at stake, you don't worry about these other elements because if you do not resist if you do not try to fight to change something then it will remain the way it is if my kids in trouble i'm going to report it to the health department Mm -hmm. and force Mm -hmm. them to come out and take a look at it and i'll take my chances with that landlord Mm -hmm. but the landlord's got to do the right thing yeah Mm -hmm. thank you so lynn chiktawaga health department good luck with that let's see we have a another question from another facebook person uh Hmm. This person's name is Zany. Do you support do you support rent cont- rent control at the city or county level? And what do you think of such an uh, what do you think such an ordinance should state? So this person um, is questioning rent control and should that be issued and would that con- help the situation at all? Well, I, I have something a bit better, a, a better. form of rent control <coughs> that, that I think works, because I, I don't know about all of the, the rent control things, but they typically will set a level, et cetera. But, but I, I think uh, we, we should have a rule that no person should be, that no landlord can charge an individual more than 20% of their income. Huh. And, and it's set at that, that, that particular level. And that landlords cannot not rent to someone because they perceive their income too low. Right. So I think you want to cap it at the percentage of, of, of an income. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Let's see if we have any more questions on here. Let's see. There's that one. And then there's other questions here. Um, hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Um, no, no, yeah, hmm, 
Okay. A lot of these are statements. (laughs) (laughs) A lot of these are statements. Okay. So continuing um, our discussion here. All right. Forgive me. We were talking about solutions. And Sarah, you've already mentioned community involvement, right? Uh, I don't think I talked uh, about that. Right. So Um, we were discussing community involvement. (laughs) I wanted to know how do you think that will help um, getting the community involved when it comes to housing disparities? Yeah. So in terms of, um, you know, if the if the goal is to create an equitable city, you can't Mm -hmm. do that without, um, you know, putting people first. And to do that, that means actually making them decision makers and not just kind of having community meetings when you do. And if you do not really taking any of that information. So, um, you know, the city could be uh, instead of kind of subsidizing uh, these developers that are creating luxury apartments, um, could be putting resources toward actual community planning and development. Development. Um, and uh, I wasn't around for this, but the mm-hmm. creation of the uh, green code I've heard was, you know, um, along these lines, there were thousands of uh, residents who were involved and whether or not the green code is actually uh, abided by at this point, um, it, it is a pretty comprehensive document that a lot of people had a um, uh, uh, hand in. Um, so that's something that, that folks could think about. One of the things along those lines, uh, and one of the problems I have with most of, of these uh, community involvement pieces uh, mm-hmm. is that the, the community does not have the final say. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, and I think that we need to flip that where the people in these neighborhoods have the veto power right. and, and mm-hmm. the final say. And, and, and that we carefully keep records to make sure that every neighborhood and community is is represented and so you have a thousand people and 85 percent of them are, are white in a town that's 48 or 49 percent people of color is, is is off the chart wrong but going back to the housing piece see we have to connect the dots one of the issues that we have is that we don't have enough people of color in the building trades right mm-hmm. what if we positively enforce these uh, uh, housing codes. The dollars that are used to rehab the units are now dollars that stay inside of the city and multiply, not like they do now escape. What if we created youth bills, Hmm, especially and trained the kids and the young adults from uh, anywhere from 15 to right. 24 and they have to the do the work in Minecraft. and yeah. so the work that is occurring in the neighborhoods is being done by kids and young adults who are being trained to do this mm-hmm. this way they are rebuilding their lives as they rebuild their neighborhoods and, and their communities and it's now what I would suggest is let's call the city out right now on Facebook to set up a demonstration project where we engage in comprehensive planning inside of that (coughs) neighborhood Mm -hmm. and that community Mm -hmm. so that we're not looking just at the house but how do we bring the vacant lots the Mm -hmm. abandoned properties Mm -hmm. all back online in 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 a way so that we can Yes, physical activity. Yep. Exactly, exactly. So it's community planning, and I think there's exactly. a big gap between mm-hmm. urban planning and health. Okay. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And forming neighborhoods. Mm. Exactly. Because yeah. there are so many things. Okay. Even obesity right. is an issue. Right. If you don't have safe places right. to walk. I mean, parents are afraid mm-hmm. to let their kids go outside and play. I know. They're, you know, they, ha- they can only shop at the corner grocery store that right. doesn't have healthy foods. No. So the all of these are health issues. And they're long-term chronic health issues. Yep. And again, it's like lead. You don't right. really see that, right. or you, d- you know, it's not an immediate concern. It's something down the line. Right. Right. But really, I think health and urban planning really have to and work yeah. together. And, and, and I think blend those yeah. to- together so that within that piece, then you create a, a way to acquire the funding to do the gap financing, because that will be gap financing that, that is required. Well, Mm-hmm. And if home, if folks can't afford to fix it up, uh, they shouldn't be renting. 
Right. Well, the real thing is we Absolutely. need community control. We don't need community engagement. We don't need com- community planning. We need community control. We also need education, right? Mm-hmm. So, right. like, mm-hmm. there's urban planning departments at most of the universities mm-hmm. in this region. Um, they do citizen planning school, but again, with the already knowledge class, as you would say. So how do we also give people a long-term capacity to understand the decisions they're making in the planning process? Because I've seen a lot of community planning meetings where somebody with an urban planning degree comes and says, these are your options and this is what is possible. Yeah, well, so we need some political the, education the, 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 and, the, and the resources already attached. City of Buffalo has a $38 million rainy day fund. Mm-hmm. It is raining lead on our children, oh. right? So. We, they have the resources right now, maybe not all that we need, but they have $38 million set aside. And right now we have children who are developing developmental disabilities. So we need money and control. Here's a point that I want to make on, in, in relationship to that. The private sector has to give up some dollars. It has to give up some dollars. And it has to give up some dollars in, in a general fund category that is available. The city has to give up some dollars, but I am not letting this private sector get off. If all of these big corporations in this area gave us 5%, including the Bills Mm -hmm. and the Sabres, Mm -hmm. 5%, then all of a sudden we have a pool of resources to do the gap level financing. And the issue of community control is, is, is right on. But that community control has to be of such that we have resources in the community right. mm-hmm. and then we have the appropriate levels of, 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 uh, of pieces in place in order to bring about the necessary forms of change. It's not that complicated and it's doable. It's just that it's a different model and we have to imagine a different way of doing things than the way we're doing it now. Well, I think it's also the city clearly has used this model intentionally. I don't think it's a failure. I think they know exactly what it's, they're it's doing. It's the model that they're using in every city in the United States. It's it's building the creative city. It's restructuring the the city and the uh, around the knowledge workers and the knowledge economy. Every city in the country is using it, and we can see the outcomes, and they're all bad. Hmm. John. Back to you. You've mentioned inclusionary zoning. Can you explain first what that is and how that will help fix this situation? Uh, well, inclusionary zoning is simply setting aside affordable units and new developments. Okay. Um, inclusionary zoning is one piece of a much larger structure that needs to happen. So the reality is we are seeing rapid gentrification that is heavily subsidized, and we're even uncovering new ways of subsidizing. So the financial gymnastics that cities and counties will use to support development um, is something that blows my mind. And if we're able to use those same gymnastics to really invest in neighborhoods, I think that that is really what we're ultimately trying to get to. This is a stopgap. This is saying, you're building this stuff. The mayor uh, two years ago said he wanted 2,000 units built uh, in the next two years, 1,000 right. units a year. Right. So if you're going to build 1,000 units a year, 30% of them should be affordable. Now, that is simply a way of slowing down what is going on and to increase the number of affordable units. But I think that that has to be paired with other solutions. Okay. It, w- w- I want to s- hang with yeah, this a that minute. One. Yeah. When we say affordable, We've got to go a bit farther because the, when I hear a lot of developers in Buffalo talk about affordability, they, they use what I call techno language to say, mm-hmm. well, we'll do 60% of the AMI, which is 60% of the aerial medial income. Right. Well, 60% is around forty-five dollars or $46,000 oh. with an average income in Buffalo of around twenty-five, twenty-six, mm-hmm. depending on what group you're in. So with these affordable units, I think they should drop down to about 30%. We want to right. get the city median income. The, well, I'll go to 30% of the AMI mm-hmm. or 20% of the AMI. That's okay. Uh, but you got to drop the floor mm-hmm. to an mm-hmm. extent that is actually affordable. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. And they get around that. Uh, and and, and uh, uh, Cis- uh, Cisneros came here to uh, via satellite to Buffalo with the new trick: workforce housing. Right. Who could be against workforce housing? You've heard of well, that. affordability mm-hmm. has to drop in a place like Buffalo for it to be affordable 
to anywhere from 20 to 30 percent of, of, of the AMI. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about inclusionary zoning, to talk about inclusionary zoning without talking about the floor of what is affordable is to mm -hmm. go back to yeah. what you were saying earlier, the gymnastic trick that they yeah. like to play. Gymnastics. I think we also definitely. should talk about the legacy of exclusionary zoning right. and mm -hmm. really the that, that this is not just a thing that we're trying to do to, to stop development or that's anti-development, but it's really thinking about the legacy of the city of Buffalo oh. and how people of color have been excluded from and taken from by the development system and how we need to build, if we're going to build the city that we talk about of good neighbors, right. we need to build our people into the new Buffalo okay. by using inclusionary zoning and using the, the city's median income um, and income levels that are going to make sure that the people that we are intending to are the ones that are ending up in those buildings. All right, all right. So I'm just going to go right over to Facebook here. We have another question. Um, person on Facebook thinks private landlording should be abolished. Is that a realistic approach? What, what do you think, right Sarah? Do? Oh, me specifically. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think that would be great. I don't know. <laughs> okay. I mean, I've never... <laughs> Uh, looked I, at the I've feasibility never heard of that. Before, of that. But yeah. I mean, I know in, in so certain countries, like in Cuba, you can only own uh, your house and then one other house. And the oh. thought there is that it's like a vacation house. It's nice. not a house that you rent to somebody else um, okay. and that you don't need to be making profit off of someone else. So in an ideal mm. world, that would be great. I don't know how necessarily that would mm -hmm. uh, pan out in terms yeah. of logistics. Yeah. But I, I think we're a long structure. way f from there. So what I'm going to suggest is... At, at this moment in time, I don't care who owns the house. What I do care is that we raise the quality of those units and that if you cannot afford to raise the quality of those units, then we will take those houses right. from you. And then we can turn those houses into cooperatives and other types of things. Right. So we have, to, we have to raise the quality of units and we have to increase their affordability so that no one... In, needs to be paying more than 20% of their income right. on, 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 on lodging. Absolutely. So if we can get to that point, I, I'm good. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think yeah. we need to talk about decommodifying our housing system, housing both as individuals, as, as building generational wealth, um, and even the whole real estate investment trust movement, right. and these buildings that are just built to be as investments. Housing is a commodity. Isn't that the it thing doesn't have to anything do to do anymore. There's, there's, like there, the there's there real now, ways right? that, that yeah. we can move in that direction. We can mm -hmm. begin to, in a place like Buffalo, push co housing. We can cre push limited dividend mm -hmm. home ownership. Mm -hmm. I mean, so there's some existing models mm -hmm. in place that, that we, we can mm -hmm. begin yeah. to push. Yeah. And but it imagines, like, right now, city leaders and, and the others, they try to trap us into thinking about either we develop the city in this current way, a market-centric way, or we face gloom and doom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if you look, for example, at a number of the Scandinavian countries, many of those countries don't have a market-centric approach to housing. They have a people-centric approach to housing. Right. And it comes out very differently. Right. There is a third way. It's not gloom or doom or this market-centric way. And we should look at strategies for moving in that third way, which is people-centric and leads us in the direction okay. of a just city. All right, well, we got to wrap it up. Um, we're going to go to you. Um, we're going to give everybody not a minute to say maybe like a closing statement. Um, now, we previously talked about maybe tackling this issue from the inside out. That's kind of how I viewed it, from inside the homes um, when it comes to... Um, the symptoms of this and where we see the symptoms. We see the symptoms in the children and we see the symptoms in the asthma and the exposure to lead and the, the sort of mental impair impairment. What do you mean by when you, when you say it's, it's the education and sort of working at the issue from the inside out? Well, we really want to empower families and education is a huge way to do that. They have to recognize, first of all, that there are hazards there. Um, they need to avoid the hazards. And just one thing as a pediatrician and as a doctor, 
we they I don't want people to do harm. They shouldn't tackle things that they don't know how to tackle. Okay. So as far as issues in terms of mold and as far as lead, um, as far as pesticides, if they don't, we 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 need to tackle those problems, and they want to get rid of those problems. Mm -hmm. But it needs to be done in a very educated way. And right. again, reaching out to the health department, okay. finding credible people. I mean, there have been children that have been killed in the past by improper use of pesticides Ooh. within the past five to ten years okay. in other parts of, of the United States. Right. But chemicals are very dangerous, and it's just, I just like to warn people and families that right. don't take on too much. and, and Health department. Exactly. Something's wrong. Landlord's not fixing it. Go to the health department. Yes. Uh, any closing statements that you'd like to make? Um, I mean, I think it's it's been mentioned a few times, but just mm -hmm. uh, to emphasize the power of community land trust. So um, there's one that's really picking up and getting off the ground right now. And I don't even know that we've fully defined uh, what a community land trust is, but essentially it is the decommodification of of housing, um, housing that's held on, on land that's held by the community and the community can make decisions about uh, what happens in, with that housing and with uh, the green spaces in that neighborhood and who rents, uh, who, you know, if there's going to be a grocery store there or a, a nursery school, whatever it might be. So um, just to know that that's, that's a really powerful solution and it's something that's already happening and has a lot of potential. Okay. Professor Taylor. I'd like to see us fight to do a demonstration project on the east side. With the kids, right. the one that you were talking about yeah, earlier. Yeah, that okay. allows us to do a form of holistic development mm -hmm. and that uh, works with the city and the courts to try something different, mm -hmm. to see if we can make a, a, a fundamentally transform an area and mm -hmm. learn the lessons that we can learn mm -hmm. there and then move forward that we need to reimagine how we can build the city. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got enough experience now to, to look at this uh, creative city building model that is uh, market-centric to know that it will increase hardships on families and individuals. We know that it will lead to increased uh, 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 difficulties inside of neighborhoods and communities. We know it's a model that will be harmful to large numbers of people. So we have an opportunity here in Buffalo to reimagine doing work and trying something differently. Mm -hmm. And if the city and others are willing to try something like that, I'll volunteer to work with it. All right. I like that. At and no I, cost. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. And I like the word reimagine. Definitely. Um, what do you think? Last statements? Um, I think the city of Buffalo, um, yeah. the corporations that are here, especially the banks who are so responsible for the housing crisis, um, need to invest as much in the people of this city as they've invested in developers. Um, I think that we need community control that is both layered on a citywide level, but also built neighborhood by neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I think that we absolutely have the resources to solve every one of these issues. Uh, we simply have a political will that is centered around the market and not people. So housing needs to be a human right, and the resources need to be put in place to, to make that a reality. Um, and for the people who are on Facebook, all of us have a responsibility to hold our elected officials, and not just those, but you know people in the Office of Strategic Planning, um, people at every single level accountable to do this because I firmly believe that if every person who was impacted by housing poverty crisis uh, showed up at the doorstep of City Hall right. on one day, uh, showed up at the voting booth uh, this year, next year, yeah. and three years from then, um, then none of these problems would exist. So okay. I think we have to take full responsibility for what we can do to solve these issues and how we can force our elected officials um, and the corporations that have exploited racism and classism in Buffalo for generations uh, to solve these problems that they created. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, time is up. I want to thank everyone for watching. I want to thank all of our panelists here for sitting with us tonight. It's really awesome conversation. The conversation continues online. You can watch a replay on our Facebook. Also, keep an eye out for future events in the months ahead. We'll have more on racial equity, mental health, and other topics. Visit our website, wbfo.org. I'm Angelica Morrison. Thanks for watching and have a good evening.